This is a warning to all those listening. Here on this radio program, we bring you stories of the paranormal and supernatural. We investigate the mysteries veiled in the darkness, knowing full well that that which is unknown cannot be unseen. So we urge you, listener, turn off your radio now. Find another channel. Because once you embark on this tale with us, there's no turning back. I'm not sure what prompted the discussion. My friend came over for a drink, and the subject somehow wandered over to dreams. That's when I mentioned to him, half in jest, that I never had a dream. Every night I closed my eyes and returned the following morning. My friend found this incredulous, of course. But more than that, he felt pity, as if I was missing out on a vital part of the human existence. I laughed and told him I've had quite enough of that for one lifetime. But he pressed the issue, insisting that dreams were nothing like real life. So I asked him, then how is it when people dream they can never tell the difference? He didn't have an answer. He just shrugged his shoulders and said, You know when you wake up. That night I was weary. Part of it was all the drinking. But it was a long day and it didn't take much for me to fall into a deep sleep. And yet for some reason the next morning I felt like I hadn't slept at all. It was unusual, but not altogether strange, so I went about my day the same way I always did, until my friend came to visit once more. This, too, I found out, because he told me yesterday he was leaving town. When I asked him why he was still here, he said he was leaving tomorrow. At first I thought I simply misheard him, but the things he said, the way he acted, it was clear he hadn't seen me in weeks. Then the conversation from yesterday began to repeat itself. He said all the same things and told all the same stories, right up to the point where the subject turned to dreams. In fact, I found the same question coming out of my mouth, just as he finished insisting dreams were nothing like real life. Then how is it when people dream, I asked him, they can never tell the difference? From then on, I started to notice things. Little things, tiny little clues that revealed the truth. Things like the taste of a cold beer, the sound of a seashell, or the touch of someone you love. Oh, it was an adequate impersonation, I'll give it that. But there was something off. Something about the world that made it feel like a stranger. It occurred to me then that maybe I was still asleep. That this was God's way of humoring me. If that was the case, and this was truly a dream, then all I had to do was ride it out. At some point, I would wake up. But when days turned to weeks, and weeks turned to months, and months to years, I began to lose conviction that the old world, my world, was the waking one. Maybe that was the dream, and I had only now woken up. There was really only one way to find out. If I'm wrong that I imagine the coroner will rule this a suicide. But I'm making this recording now so you'll know I didn't make this decision lightly. I just know that if I don't do something now, I may be stuck in this world forever, a world in which I don't belong. And whether this is wisdom or folly, dream or death, the answer is on the other side of that noose. My hope is that I'll know when I wake up. ask you something. Why don't you ever listen to the radio when you drive? What? You don't like talking to me? You'd rather listen to some Yahoo you've never even met? Oh, don't be cross. You know as well as I do it's a ten-hour drive to San Francisco. We can't talk the entire time. Nobody's that interesting. 
Well, then you're just going to have to live with the silence. I never listen to the radio. Now you're pulling my leg. You mean you've never listened to a radio program, ever? Not since I was a kid. Why not? It's not important. If it's not important, then you won't mind if I fiddle with the dial. Hey, don't touch that. Oh my, you're serious. What exactly happened to you? Leave it be. But you're the one who wanted to talk. I said leave it be. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Humor me? <sighs> All right. It happened back when I was a kid. My uncle, he got me a radio for my birthday. It was a strange gift because I never really listened to music. I suppose it was more of a toy to me. I'd fiddle with the dials, just turn it to random places, even if all it picked up was static. Only this one night, I was having trouble sleeping, and I turned it to some station I'd never heard of. What kind of station was it? That's the thing. I don't think it was a station at all. More like some kind of emergency broadcast channel. But I knew it was broadcasting something because there was no static. There was just this scratching noise. It would just go on for hours on a loop. I couldn't figure out what it was exactly, but I'd sit there all night just listening to it. Scratch, scratch, scratch. How long did this go on? For about a week. I'd listen to it every night before I went to bed. It actually helped with my sleep problems. I'd count the scratches like I was counting sheep. Until one night I turned on the radio, and there was nothing but static. Whatever it was, it just stopped. Did you ever find where it came from? Not at first, but the next day I heard my dad talking about a story on the news, about this car they found on the side of the road. Somebody had set it on fire, and when the police opened up the trunk of the car, they found a body. That's horrible, but I, I don't understand. What does that have to do with you? There were marks, Sharon. Scratch marks on the inside of the trunk where she tried to claw her way out. Oh my god. And you think that was her on the radio? I know it was her. It was just a coincidence. And even then, there's certainly not anything wrong with listening to the radio now. Here, I'll show you. Sharon, what are you doing? Helping you get over your superstitions. It's not a superstition. Oh, hush. Pay attention to the road. Hmm. Now that's odd. What's odd? I turn the dial to my favorite station, but I don't hear anything but static. I don't like this. You should have left well enough alone. Oh, don't be ridiculous. We must be in a dead zone. Something's interfering with the signal. In fact, I think we must be coming out of it. It's starting to get clearer. I don't oh, hear anything. You don't hear that? It sounds like a woman's voice. She's saying, turn, something. Turn around? No, no, that's not it. I don't like this at all. I don't like this one bit. Hold on, she's saying something else. Let me turn the volume up a little. I think I can... Sharon, I... Jake! Sharon! Oh, Jesus. Turn it off, Jake. The radio. You were right. You should turn it off. I never did believe my sister. And how could I? Her penchant for lying was downright pathological. I remember when we were eight. She convinced the neighborhood boys that Manta Man was her second cousin. She'd show them a toy gun and call it the Manta Ray and conjure up the most convoluted explanations for why it didn't work. She even convinced our father that the school required her to have her own terminal to turn in her homework. And sure enough, a week later, the men from Robco showed up at our door. <laughs> I wasn't even jealous. 
All I could do is marvel at what my sister had wrought. She could weave a story, of that there was no question. She would close every plot hole and have an answer for every doubt. All she needed from her audience was just a sliver of bent truth, a tiny suspension of disbelief to pull you in. So when she told me about the horror that lived inside that terminal, of course I dismissed it. It was my sister after all. I knew her better than anyone. Oh, she kept at it. She knew quite well that I was immune to her wild fits of fancy, and it would take more than a good story to make me believe. Naturally, she had no real proof. It was always at the dead of night, never when anyone else was around. The terminal would turn itself on and type these strange cryptic messages. She couldn't tell me what it said, because she didn't understand the words. But then there was the other side of it, the ever-bending truth that lay in the content of those messages. She would scribble them down every night until she had notebooks full of what she believed to be an ancient and unknown language. She was committed to this lie, that much was for sure. So committed, in fact, that I could hear her in the dead of night, typing and scribbling. She became distant, aloof, to the point that I had to struggle to maintain my disbelief. Yet the day she disappeared, I was sure it was another hoax. I knew that the moment I believed her, the second I gave in, she would show up at the door and proclaim she'd got the better of me. But she never did. Even now, when I sleep in her room, listening to her terminal type, I find it all too hard to believe. How can I? Because if this translation is correct, and what it says is true, then there's nothing I can do to save her. Dad used to talk about the Dunwich building like it was alive, not just some building made of iron and steel. It never made a lot of sense. Dad was a practical man. He never had a spiritual bone in his body. But when he spoke about that place, his voice turned low. Some might mistake it for respect, but I knew it was fear. And when he said the building might someday eat him alive, I took him at his word. Ghost stories are nothing new. There's always some tale about a house on a hill, a ghost in the walls, a bump in the night. These stories endure because there are people willing to tell them, spread them from generation to generation like a family heirloom. And while they may seem like ancient folklore, the mere fact that these stories exist are proof they aren't real. Because ghost stories don't get told. They die with the screams of the people who live them. So why should you believe me? Maybe because I'm not telling you a story. I'm, I'm telling, telling you where to find me. You don't walk into the darkness. You fall. You plummet further and further into the void until there's nothing left save the time between the fall and the ground. It's in that ever-shrinking distance that fear resides, ageless and all-knowing. 
And as you find yourself consumed by this dread, you never realize that it isn't the fall or the ground that kills you. It's the fear. So we advise you, change the station. Because once you tune in to the darkness, it doesn't matter whether you're really falling or not. There is no climbing out. Thanks for putting me up. I'm gonna need to lay low for a little while. It's no problem, but I gotta ask, Charlie, how long do you plan on staying on here? For Christ's sake, Tony, I shot a cop. This isn't going away anytime soon. But what if they come looking for you? Why? Are you thinking about selling me out? No, of course not. I'm no rat. Let's shut the hell up and start acting like it. <sighs> what was that? I didn't hear anything. It sounded like a door opening. Who's up there? There's no one up there. This house is just old. You lying to me? Look me in the eye and tell me you aren't lying. I'm not lying. Jesus, Charlie. Fine. What do you gotta eat around here? There's some food in the kitchen. <laughs> you always did have bad taste in beer. That's all I can afford right now. Things have been tough ever since I got laid off. Hmm. Well, you could always turn me in for a reward. That's not funny. <sighs> I didn't have a choice, you know. It was him or me. I get it. Do you? Yeah. I can't imagine what it's like to take someone's life. It's scary if you think about it. It wasn't scary at all. In a situation like that, your instincts take over. Next thing you know, he's dead and you aren't. That's what I mean. It's scary how easy it is. We're supposed to be a civilized species above that sort of thing. Above what? Murder? Instinct. Okay. Now I know you're hiding something. I don't know what you're talking about. The footsteps, Tony. You don't think I hear them? What footsteps? Don't play dumb with me. You thought you could stall me while your friends call the cops. What? I, I told you, I got laid off. The phone company cut the service out last week. You lying son of a bitch. You expect me to believe that? Put down the gun, Charlie, please. <laughs> phone company. What a load of bull. Huh. He wasn't lying. So, you want to hear a story? <coughs> well, I got one I can tell you. The whole thing started two nights ago. I got taken downtown by a couple coppers. They caught me trying to stick up a red rocket. One of them fancy new ones they got for those atomic cars. Problem is, I had this bad cold I couldn't shake. And when I started coughing, that gave the clerk a chance to reach for his piece. An hour later, the cops, they had me in cuffs. <laughs> Even worse, the copper who arrested me, well, I bumped off his partner about three months ago. And now he's been on my case ever since. Yeah, there's a real bad rap with no way out. What do you want, copper? Whatever it is, you can't make me talk. You killed my partner, you filthy rat. Jimmy Buchanan. Remember? October 3rd, 2049. Jimmy Buchanan? That guy? Listen, do you think this pretty mug is capable of a murder like that? I was at Bristol that day. Just ask Kit Malone. Runs a bar downtown. He'll tell you. Oh, I'm sure he will. I'm sure all your boys will vouch for you. But this ain't a court of law. Oh, yeah? What is this place, anyway? <laughs> you ever heard of Lenny the Lip? He was a cop killer, too. Lenny the Lip. Lenny the Lip. 
No, don't ring any bells. Yeah, I bet it doesn't. See, we didn't give poor Lenny a trial. No papers, no judge, just four walls and a lifetime to think. So, you left him here alone to rot? That was the plan. Except we only had him here for three days before he just up and vanished. You saying he got away? No, I'm saying he vanished. In the thin air. Yeah, I couldn't figure it out either. There wasn't a trace of him in or out of the cell. I even spent a night in there, just to try and get in his head. I didn't find a shred of evidence. Well, except for the smell. Whoa, what do you mean? What smell? You don't smell it? It's all over this prison. All right. Let me throw another name at you. Johnny Scars. Ever heard of him? Yeah, you know who I'm talking about. The serial killer. The one that sliced up all those peoples and turned them into art. One sick bastard, that one. He died here too, you know. The judge gave him the chair, right in this very prison. But what you don't know is, when the doc strapped him in, he got the voltage wrong. <laughs> but it wasn't long before we all figured it out. In fact, I was standing right over there when the flames started to melt his skin. Jesus, you coppers are sick, you know that? <laughs> you know what's the hardest part of watching a man get the chair? It isn't the shaking or the sparks or even the screams. It's the smell. That faint, crisp smell of a man being cooked alive. What do you plan on doing with me? <laughs> me? I don't plan on doing anything. See, you asked me earlier if we left Lenny alone to rot. Well, we left him in that cell. But he sure as hell wasn't alone. Say hi to Johnny for me. No! Wait! Come back here! Let me out of here, you filthy coppers! Let me out of here! That was the last I saw of that cop. It's been two days without a pot to piss in. Don't know how long they plan on making me stay here. Maybe they think if they leave me here alone, I'll start seeing things. Maybe they want me to beg them to let me out. Before Johnny Scars comes for me. The copper said Lenny was in here for three days, so I just gotta last until then. Still, something's off about this cell. Like there isn't enough air inside. Like it's hard to breathe. Almost as if something's burning. Evening, sir. How may I help you? Well, this is going to sound a bit strange, but I was wondering if you could tell me where I am. Why, you're in a hotel. Right, but <laughs> where? What city? City? I'm afraid you're confused. There are no cities here. What do you mean? Ah, we get your type all the time. You must have been in an accident. That's why you don't remember how you got here. How did I get here? I'm afraid there's no way of putting this gently. So I'll just come out and say it. You're dead. What? That's ridiculous. I'm standing right here. You are. And you're not. Look behind you, for instance. Don't you find it strange that this hotel has no front door? How exactly did you get inside? I don't know. Maybe this is some kind of trick. That's certainly possible. Perhaps, as you say, this is all an elaborate stage. But there are some things a person can't fake. Like a pulse. Why don't you check yours? Why, I... I don't feel anything. Now check mine. You see? Nothing. Now, if I may have your name... Uh, it's, uh, uh Robin. Robin Archer. 
Archer, Archer. Why, yes, here you are. Stamped in the corner of Main and Fifth at 6.47 p.m. Pronounced dead at the scene. I, uh, I remember. There was a man on the street. He asked for the time and then... Jesus, it's true. I'm, I'm dead. I'm really dead. It appears so. So, what happens now? Well, you have a choice. While we don't have any doors, you may have noticed we do have an elevator. In fact, you can take it down to the ground floor, back from whence you came. Wait, I can go back? Why didn't you just say so, then? If that's the case, I'm going home right now. It's not that simple, Mr. Archer. You go back, and you'll be starting over from the beginning. You'll have a new name, a new family, and a new life. And if I take the elevator up? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Mold by philosophers and drunks alike. What world awaits us after we die? It would be so much easier if we knew the answer. Are you saying you don't know what's up there? Oh, heavens, no. I don't have the courage. You see, I was once like you. The problem is, I could never decide which way to go. Up or down. So I ended up just staying here and keeping count. But why not just take the elevator up? That's heaven up there, right? There's none of the evils and horrors you'll find back on Earth. And yet, let me ask you something. Who allowed those evils to exist? I don't know. I guess that would be God. And after all you've seen, after how you got here, do you believe he's a benevolent one? How do you know what's waiting for you up there is any better than what's down below? I guess it's a matter of faith. I'm afraid so. You must choose between the devil you know and the God you don't. So what's the count? How many people go up, and how many go down? As a matter of fact, it's dead even. 999,999,999. On both sides. You will break the tide. Huh. Well, then there's nothing left to do but choose. That was surprising. Thought for sure he'd go the other way. I thought so, too. But either way, that settles it. The agreement was a first to a billion, wasn't it? Yes. It's rather unfortunate for them. But no one can say we didn't give humanity a choice. True enough. Free will is tricky that way. I can never figure out if it's a strength or a flaw. Well, perhaps the next world will prove more decisive. Let's go. Hello? Is anyone up there? Yes. What is it? What do you want? I'm a reporter for the Bugle. I'm doing a story on the history of Kingsport Lighthouse. Well, you shouldn't have come. It's been abandoned for the past 20 years. I'm sorry, I don't understand. How can that be? You're not from around here, are you? Yes, I moved here from a place near London about a month ago. I see. And why do you want to do a story on this lighthouse? It just seemed like an important landmark. And when I ask people about it, they want to change the topic. To be honest, I found the whole thing rather curious. Well, there's a reason for that. I suppose you've never heard of a young girl named Gabrielle King? No, I can't say I have. What's so important about her? 
It happened about 30 years ago. Gabby was about 14 years old, loved sailing. But one season a heavy storm hit the coast, and the word was she got lost out at sea. Sounds personal. Did you know the girl? No, but I was a member of the Coast Guard at the time. I guess you could say it was my job to find her. And for the next four weeks we tried our best. In fact, we spent day and night combing the ocean through a bout of heavy storms, looking for any trace of her boat. I imagine it would be hard to see much of anything. True. It was dangerous for everyone involved. But it helped having the lighthouse at our back. The signal man, we called him. He was our life preserver. It didn't matter how late it got or how troublesome the weather. Whenever one of the boats stretched out too far, his light was always there, ready to guide us home. But for all our vigilance, we never found the boat, and so the coroner proclaimed her dead, and the family held a funeral. That must have been hard for everyone involved. Yes, I felt like I'd let the family down. I quit the Coast Guard, and spent the next ten years working inland. But part of me always wanted to come back to the lighthouse and thank the signalman, because without him, I would have never made it through those storms. So when things settled down, I asked the lighthouse steward if I could meet him. He told me the keeper was a quiet man who didn't want to be disturbed, so I insisted. And when he declined again, I decided to wait until the dead of night, walk up the lighthouse stairs by myself. I didn't think I'd be much of a bother. All I wanted to do was shake the man's hand who saved my life. But when I climbed those steps, what I found almost stopped my heart. Why? What did you find? It was the girl. Frail, beaten, dying. She was forced to live in that infernal tower for God knows how long. She'd never gone sailing. She never even left the shore. My God. All the time we were out at sea, every time she flashed the light from the tower, she wasn't guiding us home. She was crying for help. And we failed her. But you found her. You saved her. No. I was too late. She died before I could get her to the hospital. After that, they shut down the lighthouse. It was too painful a memory. Maybe we all just wanted to forget. But I don't understand. If it's abandoned, then where's that light coming from? Who's working the lighthouse now? Don't you see? It's her. That's her signal. It doesn't matter if we want to forget. She won't let us.